Hey guys, it's Dr. Hayes, and this is the second video for our coming of age literature class, coming of age novels class. This is the first class, the first lecture that we're going to be talking about uh, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations specifically, and in class we will discuss some of the themes from the novel um, as far as coming of age, some questions and whatnot, but over the next couple weeks um, you'll have these online lectures to watch uh, about some sort of background stuff, some context for the novel. So for this first one, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Charles Dickens himself. Uh, not too much, not like a bog down of his biography, but just a little bit about him and how it relates to Great Expectations. And then um, point out a few themes from Great Expectations from the text that um, are sort of autobiographical, taken from Dickens' um, experiences in his life. And so uh, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that there's going to be a link in the description of this video and I'll probably, I'll email it out separately as well, but there is a different video here on YouTube that um, it, it, I like to use. It's a really good um, background all about Dickens himself, just some bi biography, some biographical information about him. And plenty of people have already gone over that. There's lots of stuff about Dickens and his um, personal life that I'm not going to redo here on this video that's not efficient. I'm, so I'm going to link a, another video that I want you to watch uh, that is about Dickens himself and his life and some of the things that influence his writing. And so you'll, for your attendance this week, you'll watch this lecture and also that other video on here on YouTube about Dickens, his bio, and then the two of those together um, will give you sort of some background information about him that you could use for this week. Um, so I, I want to show you this cool book I've got. I've got this really book. John Forster um, is sort of the uh, recognized expert in, in who wrote the sort of the definitive book about uh, Charles Dickens. But And this is uh, the life of Dickens, Charles Dickens, the life of Charles Dickens that he wrote. But this is an illustrated version, so it has all kinds of uh, cool pictures and, and illustrations and, and artwork and things in it. Um, again, I'm not going to go through, through the whole life of, of Dickens in this video, but just show you that's what, that's who it is. That's our, our boy. <laughs> that's who we're talking about for the next couple of weeks. Um, very prolific writer in the Victorian era. And our, our class is focusing not just on literature in general, but a on a specific genre literature, which I talked about last time. Uh, here's a painting. Uh, we're talking about coming of age uh, novels, right? So we're not talking about um, literary styles and movements in general, but as literary elements as they relate to our genre that we're focusing on for this class. So that's what we're gonna try to keep it focused on. So you don't get too bogged down in historical developments and and literary terms and things that don't apply to our specific focus. Um, so uh, so you'll watch that video about Charles Dickens about his life and sort of um, details about that but I wanted to go over a few things specifically about um, Great Expectations. So I have some notes here that I keep looking, if y'all look down I'm looking at some notes that I wrote. <laughs> um, so Great Expectations itself, it's not the first coming-of-age novel that Dickens wrote. I like it best, so that's why I picked it for our class, but um, he actually wrote um, David Copperfield is another name you might have heard. That's a novel that Charles Dickens wrote, and it's very similar um, in general plot structure to uh, Great Expectations in that you have a young boy and he starts off sort of poor and rural and it's like how he grows up and comes into a manhood and all of the different experiences he has in that way. It's not quite so mysterious and surreal as, um, as Great Expectations with the creepy Miss Havisham and the mysterious benefactor and things like that. Um, scholars tend to think that uh, David Copperfield was a little bit more autobiographical with Dickens. It was pe people have noted very uh, various specific um, similarities between David Copperfield and Pip's story in Great Expectations to Dickens' own life. Um, so great, uh, David Copperfield came first as far as what novels that Dickens wrote, but I just 
I knew I was going to choose one of them, and so I chose Great Expectations because I think it's more interesting and I like it better. That's basically the, the gist there. Um, on Canvas, on the files, I added another file recently, Thursday, I think, and this is what it looks like, but it's a list of Charles Dickens, and it goes on to the on a second page, but it's a list of Dickens' major works. I just kind of wanted to show you um, there's this file if you wanted to print it out or if you want to look at it and it's not super involved but each of the lists I just wanted to point out each of the um, items on the list is hyperlinked so if you look at the digital version on fi on the files if you follow the link it just it just takes you to Wikipedia it's not like a research authoritative document or anything but I thought it would just be a quick reference it this is it takes you to the Wikipedia entry for that specific work or novel. So you can kind of see the basic details of it. The information on there is all pretty um, legit. It's not like somebody's hacked Dickens uh, wi uh, Wikipedia. Um, but uh, before Great Expectations, Great Expectations is one of the one of the later things that Dickens wrote. Um, he started publishing in the 1830s and um, Great Expectations came out in the 1860s, so Dickens had a few decades of well-known publishing career before Great Expectations came out. He had Oliver Twist came out before this, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, A Christmas Carol, um, the, let's see, Bleak House, Hard Times, which is one of my favorite, A Tale of Two Cities, David Copperfield. Lots of Christmas stories that came out. He was a publisher. He had uh, lots of magazines that he published. And so Great Expectations was one of, there was only a few things he wrote after that um, in his lifetime. So I wanted to kind of put that in context for you. Um, a little bit about the publishing of Great Expectations as well before we start in with like the items from the text. Great, uh, pretty much all of Dickens' works, works, most of them, and really pretty much any novel that was, um, written and published in this time period, in this Victorian era. Um, novels weren't, at the time, uh, f published right away as big hunks of text. You didn't just go buy books um, initially. So uh, many novels, um, many of the classic um, 17, 17 and 1800s novels that we, we think of, they were first published serially, which means it's kind of like a TV show now where an episode would come out in each issue. And so um, Dickens himself ran a few different um, publications like that were just, they had poems in it and little stories. And it was just like a, a, either a weekly or usually monthly is more, more what it was, a monthly uh, magazine that would come out that had it wasn't necessarily just all news, but it would be essays and poems and opinion pieces and short stories. And it was like a literature magazine kind of thing, but it was just a miscellaneous, interesting tidbits magazine. So he had one for a long time called Household Words, and that was what he was uh, most known for. That's not the only thing that he published in, but but Household Words was kind of his, his thing that a lot of people know him for. Um, and then he, after Household Wor Words finished, he had a, a publication called All the Year Round, and that's what A Tale of Two Cities was published in and Great Expectations was published in. And um, so it happens over the course of, I think it was November, yeah, I wrote this down, from November to, of 1860 up through, um, I think almost all the way up again and through December of 1861. Um, Great Expectations was published in installments. Um, so there'd be just a couple of chapters each month in the um, in the publication. And it might have been bi-monthly now that I'm thinking about it because it was only, that wouldn't have been enough. If you just published a couple chapters at a time, that wouldn't have been enough months. So it might have been weekly or, or you know, bi every couple weeks. I'm not sure but about the regularity of that, but it was published in chunks, right? It probably what would be the equivalent in the book of, you know, two, maybe three chapters at a time. And he, so Dickens would have the whole thing planned out, like the structure of the story and the characters and things planned out, but he would write it as he went, like as each piece came out and not just Dickens, he kind of 
pioneered this process, but other authors did it too, they would sort of wait until a, a, a segment would come out and then they would listen to the feedback and, and people would write in or people on the street would be talking about it and they would take uh, the public's reception of the latest installment into consideration and then he might change things or tweak things in the way he wrote certain sections, future sections based on um, public reception of characters and, and themes and things like that. So um, it was just kind of an interesting way of, of publishing a novel. And then usually once the serialized run of a novel had completed, then at some point soon after a publishing company would purchase the rights or purchase the, the whole manuscript and then would um, publish the novel like as a whole. Right, or, or even sometimes in volumes. Uh, you'll notice when you're reading Great Expectations, it is divided into three parts. Um, you know, the first part of Pip's Great Expectations, the second part is published in sort of three volumes. And so those three parts or three volumes of the novel would have been published or bound, they would have been bound in three separate books. That was very commonly done too because of printing technology and publishing costs and things like that. Um, it would, you'd buy the novel Great Expectations, but it would exist in three different volumes. Kind of like, y'all are probably too young for this, but kind of like back when movies used to be on VHS tapes and you had to have two different tapes if the movie was super long. It was kind of like that. Um, so that's how this would have initially been published after the serial um, run had, had broken off. Um, so and one more interesting publication tidbit, you probably notice uh, when you get to the end of Great Expectations, um, there's a little curiosity in the text, depending on which version you are, which you purchased or, or read. Um, there are two alternate endings and it changed from what Dickens had originally planned versus what originally came out. And um, the ending is significantly different. It's only, you're talking about like, a page worth of half a page difference um, of from the end. It's like one little final scene at the end of the novel that is drastically different in two different versions. And the the initial version that everybody got was the revised one. Um, the originally written intended ending page scene wasn't published until much later, decades later in later editions. Um, it was uncovered and included in the publication. So when we get to, you know, in class or something, when we get um, next week, when we're talking about the second half of the novel, we can talk about the ending and, and your thoughts about that. Okay, so I wanted to include some things from Dickens' life that show up in uh, Great Expectations. Um, so for one, uh, the other video you watch will show you that he grew up very poor. Um, he grew up um, in a rural, comparatively rural area compared to London. And he grew up, um, he lived in Hampshire for a while. And then he moved, his family moved to um, an area near Kent, which Kent and the marshes nearby is where Great Expectations is set. Um, so that's an area of uh, England that where Pip starts out in Great Expectations and that's where um, one of the places that Dickens as a, a young man and a young child grew up with his family. And so that is sort of an inspiration. And after uh, when Dickens was in adulthood and, and successful and had a family and everything, he then retired to some land um, so in a rural property near Kent once again. He kind of went full circle and went back to the place of his childhood and never lived in London again after that. So that area um, was significant to him in his life um, for his progression from boyhood into adulthood because he eventually did move to London and settle and work in publishing and then came back as an older man. So that's sort of an interesting cycle of, of development and maturity in Dickens' own personal life that we can argue might mimic Pip's experience as well. Um, so like I said, he migrated to the city with his family um, and he was a little bit older and ended up living in, in London and, and surrounding areas. Um, when Dickens was a young man, like really like, like pre-apprenticeship age, like a boy, um, we would call it like a middle schooler probably now. Um, he worked at a blacking factory, which a blacking factory, blacking is like shoe polish, like what they put on like, like 
shoes and like to lubri lubricate machinery is blacking was a, a a substance that you would use to lubricate and shine up um yeah, and oil up things that need that um and it was gruesome work uh, brutal there was no such thing as child labor laws there was no such thing as any kind of labor laws no unions so they were you know laborers and factories and this is you know right after the industrial revolution really kind of exploded you know workers especially young workers <clears throat> were expected to work long hours there was no regulation about breaks or safety codes or anything like that pay minimum pay that was not a thing so being a factory worker at the time was pretty grueling thankless work and um so it really sort of permanently affected how dickens viewed the experience of the lower classes and the plight of being born into a certain destiny as far as your wealth and um, your expectations goes. And that really had an influence on a lot of things he wrote, uh, A Christmas Carol for one, and um, you know, Hard Times, if you ever read that, Great Expectations, obviously, also. Um, there's uh, some scenes in uh, Great Expectations, a couple different scenes, some major parts in the second half, that are set in and around Newgate Prison, which is a real place, you know, in London. There's all kinds of offenders who are in Newgate. Some are murderers and some are just in debt. And so um, that was one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, in the second half, they uh, Pip is, a, he's attempted to be arrested. Like the authorities attempt to come and arrest him and take him to prison because he owes debts. But he's too sick and they can't, he can't they can't move him so um dickens own father for a time when he was growing up when dickens was young was in debtor's prison and this was a real thing that would happen if you owed money and you couldn't pay it back they would just put you in jail which is kind of counterintuitive because how are you supposed to earn any money if you're in jail <laughs> to pay back your debts but it was called debtor's prison and so you had to stay there until the debts were paid and so what that meant was someone who in your family was obligated to pay your debts um, to get you out of prison. And so that usually fell onto a debt or debtor's wife or parents or family, children even, which is why Dickens had to work in factory conditions in the first place because his dad was, his father had debts and was poor. Um, and so Dickens um, mother was sort of forced to take on various jobs and like the kids in the family and and so when if someone was in debtor's prison like say a man it was always usually a man who was in debtor's prison um his family could come and go like a lot of times men's wives would move in with them and like move into the debtor's prison with them and like the wife could come and go could go to the shops could go to work could you know visit children if the children were staying with family members or whatever the wives could come and go but the the prisoner had to stay put in prison it was just a really weird situation and so dickens had personal experience with um the debtor's prison system and how it worked and the requirements and so um it's mentioned in several of his novels and great expectations is one of them um dickens uh, mother did die when he was young after after this of course but still very young and so um pip having the experience of of being an orphan and not having a mother uh figure after too much um further into his uh, adulthood is is something that um you know the absence of mothers comes up a lot in, in stuff that dickens writes um so there's some things about education and great expectations dickens had a lot to say about the educational system in england and what kinds of education were available to which citizens based on their birth and their class and and what was expected of them in society and 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 everything so dickens himself went to a school called wellington academy he went to a dame school in the town which was just basically an old lady who tutored people um which pip went to as well and miss wopsle um old mrs wopsle who, who taught her taught pip um, and then eventually uh dickens went to a place called wellington academy which he uh, claims was not a great school he didn't really get a great education there but Dickens himself had sort of a natural genius so he was able to compensate so Pip's um, dissatisfaction with his education uh, in Great Expectations is definitely taken from Dickens personal life experience and what he saw as sort of an epidemic in um, England which is 
the lower class you are, the lower quality of education you, you receive, and it just perpetuates the cycle of, you know, maintaining the, the, the class system. And that's the only way in Great Expectations that Pip has an opportunity to get any kind of better education is through his inheritance and to, be, to get more money. So the kind of education he receives when he's poor um, is, dra is juxtaposed with the kind of education he's expected to receive when he becomes, um, you know, has an income. Which is he? He goes and he becomes a he gets a tutor. Uh, Matthew Pocket's father, or Matthew Pocket Herbert's father. You know he he gets a gentleman's tutor rather than a low quality village school, right? And so Dickens' own experience with education comes out in Pip's experience with education and Great Expectations. Um, Pip is all or you know yeah Pip is also very snobby about. Education. So Pip has a character, um, recognizes the sort of elevation that having any kind of education does to a person. Um, so even with the minimum education of, of um, bare minimum literacy that he receives, still makes him feel superior to like Joe and the people in his life who don't have that same education. Um, and so lording that higher education level over his... Um, the people in his vicinity is a mark sort of his, of his maturity, his immaturity, you know, the novel. It's, it's ungentlemanly <laughs> behavior that he does, but we can talk more about that in class. Um, uh, after Dickens came through school and got an education, he did end up working as a law clerk for a little while, which is what uh, Wemmick does. Wemmick is one of, Wemmick in London becomes one of um, Pip's best friends. He's the one who is serious and no nonsense and seems mean at work because he's uh, Mr. Jagger's secretary, his clerk. But then when he goes home, he has this whimsical home that's shaped like a castle and has a drawbridge and he has a sweet girlfriend and he has his aged parent, his father who lives with him and they just have the best old time. Um, so he has these two sort of two personas and, um, so several of the scenes in Jagger's law office, um, with Wemmick as the clerk and, you know, that character, um, and the, the sort of whole scene with their office, some of that's probably taken from Dickens' own experience because, like I said, Dickens himself worked as a law clerk, um, after school before venturing full-time into publishing and publication jobs. Um, so one more, th one more thing I want to mention about, um, Dickens' personal life is that, um, I mentioned the Great Expectations came out toward the end of his end of his career, end of his life. And toward the end of his life, um, Dickens himself had a lot of sort of personal restlessness. This sort of, um, he, his marriage fell apart. He had, he was married, but by all accounts, he was not a very good husband. He was not a good father. He was not attentive to his children. He was unfaithful to his wife. Um, so he was not a very good man personally. He was a genius uh, right author and writer and just sort of observer of society and human nature, but he was not a very good person, as per, uh, per, good man personally, I guess you would say. And so his marriage had kind of broken up and he had started sort of an affair with this other woman and he was sort of estranged from his family. Um, he had moved and moved out of the city and resettled in his uh, childhood, near, not near his, you know, just in the same area of where he started life in rural Kent. Um, he had recently cut ties with a long-term publisher that he had had um, over various um, unhappiness and, and disagreements. It's not important, but he had cut ties with a long-term publisher he had had. He had severed some close long-term friendships that he had had for a long time. Um, probably over some of the, their, his personal choices and some of his, um, opinion, political opinions and all kinds of things. But toward the end of his life, the last few things he published are sort of colored by this, um, melancholy, this restlessness. And so we can kind of see that coming out in some of the scenes and some of the inner monologue that Pip has about oh, what is, what's the point of this? What is my purpose? you know, who is in charge here, who, and you know, what am I even doing, what is important and what's not. So Pip kind of has to go through this whole journey where he's questioning what's important and what isn't. And, um, 
what makes a man and what makes a gentleman and and um, sort of overcoming his uh, tendency toward more uh, superficial accomplishments uh, and, you know and his tendency to privilege superficial accomplishments and wealth um, and notoriety over um, family and and goodness right and general goodness and so there's a lot of these sort of um, personal issues and questions that Dickens himself was dealing with toward you know in his older adulthood um, as his life was kind of re, re like shifting and rearranging and falling apart and so that restlessness and change uh, comes out in some of the um, uh, hopelessness and and questioning and stuff that Pip experiences of course a lot of what Pip experiences is also because he's a young man he's he's a you know a lot of the book he's a teenager growing into early 20s and so um, that is just sort of a restless questioning time in a young person's life in general um, but we can kind of see where Dickens is infusing some of his own personal um, uncertainties and restlessness into Pip's experience in the novel um, I think that that's pretty much all I want to go over for this one. Um, so th the information from this video combined with the biography uh, video, that the link I'm going to send you, which is a lot fancier and has animation and, and all kinds of stuff. It's, all, it's a much better video than just me here talking about all the details of Dickens' life. So you, if you watch that and then this one combined, I think you've got plenty of background information um, about Charles Dickens, enough for us to discuss this novel for the class. Um, and uh, next week I'm going to go in the lecture here, I'm gonna go into more detail about um, just more general historic context about um, what was expected of a young male like Pip in Victorian England at the time. You know, what it was like depending on what class you were and you know what your expectations would have been uh, to grow up as a young man in Victorian England like Pip is in, in the novel. So. Uh, next week will be this video, the lecture will be a little bit more just of some historical context about um, if Pip really existed in, in England, what would his um, life be like and how would he come of age and what, what that would look like. So um, until then, until next time, I'll see you in class when we discuss the novel and uh, get in touch. And let me know if you have any questions and I hope you guys have a great week. Bye.